This part here, marked 82S100, uh, is the first commercially successful programmable logic device. Introduced by a company called Signetics in 1975, sold for $25 back then. That was about $116, so certainly not an inexpensive component, but it found a lot of success because it allowed computer makers to sweep a half a dozen uh, TTL design chips into a, a single device, and that was uh, pretty appealing. You could start uh, really densifying your design with this particular component. I even found use actually as the price dropped on uh, some of the very early personal computers. The uh, Commodore C64 had uh, one of these on it actually. So, uh, of course, for programmable logic, you're probably thinking companies like Altera uh, or Xilinx, uh, but uh, this is it. This particular device is where it uh, all began. So let's uh, take a look at uh, how programmable logic uh, got started and what the actual silicon die looks like. All right, I've de-encapsulated the uh, component. Uh, that means I've dissolved the uh, plastic packaging around it. You can see a silicon die there, and then just below that's some copper. Um, that's the lead frame that actually held the component uh, in place. I usually uh, do the de-encapsulation with a very precise amount of acid, uh, but uh, this particular package was very large, 28 pins with a 0.6 inch uh, pitch spacing, which uh, has a lot of material on it. Let's, um, uh, so of course I didn't quite get all the packaging dissolved. Let's uh, put a microscope onto this silicon die and uh, see if we can get a photograph so we can start sorting down what's going on. So here's the actual uh, photograph of the uh, silicon die. It looks like there's sort of three regions here, one here, a couple here. You can see the I.O. pads, of course, going around the sides. Uh, to sort down what we're looking at, um, first of all, we notice that there's some larger pads here, which uh, indicate this is, these are probably the power connections here. And uh, the, if you take a, uh, the actual uh, data sheet uh, from Signetics, uh, you can sort of see the power is on this side. That's VCC and grounds down this side here. And the way it works is that uh, once you determine if this is, uh, say, pin 14, uh, pardon me, pin 28, you can then figure this must be pin 1 coming around. Now, uh, if you look closely here, you can see that there is a pattern of what appears to be differences. And these are the, uh, the fuses, and they've uh, been blowing. Fuses are really interesting. They, uh, they're, they're called nichrome. And uh, what happened here is I've just zoomed into the array, and let's see if we can find a fuse which is intact. Here's an intact fuse, uh, and uh, here's some blowing fuses. Uh, and what they do is they actually melt the metal. And if you look really closely here, there's actually little sputters of metal as it sort of uh, melted under uh, the uh, what, 30 volts, I think, was for programming it. And, and of course, once the fuse was uh, programmed, that was it. The uh, the part was uh, scrapped if you had made a mistake. So you'd be throwing away $100 at a time each time you did a, a rev on the uh, design during debug. So I'm sure that the engineers uh, were extremely careful to try to avoid spending uh, too much money because that is a problem. Now, uh, as to why there's two arrays, of course, you have to go to the data sheet and uh, we can sort of sort down uh, what this is. Let me just uh, zoom in a bit. So a programmable logic array is all about having some inputs here and some outputs here. And basically what happens is that each input gets its uh, true signal here and a complement signal here driven into an array. And what you can do there, of course, is you can create any combination of um, signals and it together. These are a series of AND gates. So you could create a signal, for example, called A and B and C not, for example, uh, could be easily done in, in this kind of array. And that's, that's the AND array. And then over here is the OR array, so you could take the terms and uh, OR them together. So you could do things like A and B and C, uh, OR, D, NOT, and A, or any combination. And uh, if you remember your digital logic courses, you course from here, you can recognize you can actually create any possible logic uh, that you desire with this sort of a topology. Now let's see, um, it's uh, 48 terms long here. And, of course, if we start looking at the actual semiconductor, we start counting, there's 48 going this way. So it looks like, you know, this is the orientation this way. And the question is, this OR array, is this the OR array? And that's the AND array? And uh, I'm pretty sure it is. And uh, that's because when you uh, roll back the, uh, the sheet here I used to sort of figure out where it is, uh, you can sort of see where the pin numbers are. And you start tra tracing the uh, traces, and I believe this is the orientation. And of course, that would uh, leave the question as to uh, what this is. And I believe this must have to do with the actual program of the fuses. You have to drive really significant voltages in to blow the fuses. But then, of course, once that's done, that circuitry is no longer required. And uh, I think there's a fair bit of chip required for that assembly. Uh, now, the reason I actually know that is that there was actually... Uh, this is a really important chip in computer history. And the Computer History Museum did a study of it. Uh, they actually had brought in some of the key design engineers and they had a nice discussion. I'll link this paper in uh, if you like to take a read of it. It's uh, 
a good example of uh, what was going on uh, way back in the mid 70s. Now, what's really cool, uh, Ronald Klein, uh, who was actually one of the primary designers of this chip, uh, the best thing about the internet is you can actually uh, uh, find people's names. Uh, and I believe this is the fellow, uh, Ron Klein, now a senior director at uh, Lattice. And if you look at his history, it looks like it matches up. So as a young man, uh, I believe that uh, he was uh, significantly responsible for this particular design. Uh, what else can we see here? Uh, let's just sort down these pads a bit more. Let's just put the paper back on and put the trace of paper back in. Uh, basically, these are all inputs on this side, power inputs. And then the outputs are here, uh, and here there's eight outputs and um, 16 inputs. So if these are the outputs here, it looks like these two sections here are the drivers. Uh, basically, you have the uh, two arrays, and there's drivers on this side, and there's drivers on this side for the signal integrity. Uh, we're going to create, of course, a stronger signal, because I'm sure there's a fair bit of signal loss through these uh, fairly large arrays. Uh, it's actually a fairly slow part, too, about 50 nanoseconds to push a signal through it. So. Uh, uh, definitely that became much better as time went on. So a after this part here, there was a company called Monolithic Memories. They started to simplify the chip. $25 is too much money. Um, and they got rid of one of the arrays and they produced a whole series of parts called PELs. Uh, then these uh, fuses were replaced by uh, programmable devices. Uh, Altera went for an EEPROM based approach uh, with theirs. There was a company called Lattice Semiconductor, which went with the uh, E squared prom so they could be reprogrammed on the fly, which is quite convenient. Uh, and then eventually, of course, these particular ones are still very much in production. Uh, you get the Xilinxes, which went into more of a fine-grained approach. But here it is. This is the, uh, the very beginning of uh, programmable logic. And what you're looking at is one of the earliest designs.